Welcome to episode 237 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Paul Letursky, who served in the FBI for eight years, three as a support employee and five as a special agent. Paul was assigned to the Cincinnati and former Alexandria divisions, working murders, aircraft hijackings, bank robberies, extortion, and con men. In this episode, Paul reviews his memoir, The Director, My Years Assisting J. Edgar Hoover, in which he offers a unique inside look at one of the most powerful law enforcement figures in American history. In 1965, when he was 22 years old, Paul was assigned to assist the legendary FBI director who had just turned 70 and had by then led the FBI for an incredible 41 years. Paul's is a rare account from someone who, for a period of years, spent hours with Hoover on a daily basis. Paul resigned from the Bureau when United Airlines recruited him to join their law department. He later became vice president of Pan America World Airways in charge of five global divisions. Paul is currently an adjunct professor and coordinator of the criminal justice program at Tillamook Bay Community College in Tillamook, Oregon. I found Paul's book and this interview with him to be thought-provoking. I share my thoughts about Hoover and the status of the FBI today in my August Reader Team email that I'm going to be sending out on Monday, August the 2nd. So if it's not in your inbox next Monday, you know what to do. Check your spam filter and your promotion tab. Before we get to the interview, I want to remind you to download and listen to episode 234. You may have missed it because of the way I released it. And I'm telling you, it's a good one with two FBI profilers about serial killer Gary Bowles and the Behavioral Analysis Unit's Assessment Interview Research Project. If you're a fan of the Netflix show Mindhunter, this episode is about the real deal. So after you finish listening to this episode, check out episode 234. I also want to welcome new listeners and invite you to join my reader team, where once a month, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. I haven't decided what FBI TV show or movie I'll be reviewing this month, so if you're listening to this before the weekend and you have a suggestion, let me know what show featuring the FBI I should review this month for FBI accuracy. When you join my reader team, I'll send you my FBI reality checklist, 20 cliches about the FBI, and my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of nearly 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on FBI Retired Case File Review. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guests. Paul Letursky. Hey, Paul, how are you? Just fine, thanks. Yourself? I am doing excellent today. And I have to tell you that I was a little hesitant at first. I'm I'm admitting this. When I got your book, The Director, My Years Assisting J. Edgar Hoover, I had not read a book about J. Edgar Hoover before. I assumed that I knew everything that I needed to know. I had just watched a documentary on Hoover and Martin Luther King, and I thought, well, you know, I'll read it. And Paul, I am so glad I did. It's a fabulous book. Well, thank you. Not only is it about your personal stories about working directly for J. Edgar Hoover and his office with Helen Gandy, but it also is a historical account, at least it was for me, of some of the things that occurred that make people 
uncomfortable about the Hoover era. So what I have to ask you, though, I know it's a standard question, but it really is one that I'm curious about. After almost 50 years, because next year it will be 50 years since Hoover's death. Why now? Why did you write the book now? You know, because of the events that are going on now and and the investigations of the Department of Justice, it just seemed like it was time to show how history is repeating itself. Mm -hmm. And I I never had an intention of publishing a book for commercial purposes. I have four young grandchildren, and I led a very adventuresome life, and I wanted my grandchildren to know what Grandpa had done with his life. This is my first of probably three books because of my other activities after leaving the Bureau. Loved the Bureau, loved every minute of it, loved everybody I worked with, all the agents, all the people at headquarters. It was just terrific. But I just felt it was important to get it out before I check into the big hangar in the sky. (laughs) I do think it is important for you to talk about this stuff now because you've got to be one of the last people left who knew Hoover. Uh, That's frightening to hear you. And of course, you weren't best friends, and we'll get into that, but there just aren't any people left that had had that one-on-one time with him. Well, I was in my early 20s, so I guess that's why I'm still around and there was nobody else close to my age. You know, the assistant directors and Helen Gandy was 69 years old when I entered that office. I was 23, but we had a great relationship. I miss her a lot, even till this day. We became very loyal friends. Nobody's really heard of Helen Gandy, and she was running the FBI for 50 years or almost 50 years. You're going to have to explain that to everyone that's listening. What do you mean by that? Who who was Helen Gandy? Helen Gandy was Hoover's executive administrative assistant. She started working for him when they were both in the Department of Justice in 1918, working for a bureau that was involved with the World War. And Helen Gandy went to work for him as a clerk typist. And when I found that out and started working with her, Jerry, I had to say to myself, how did she ever get the job? She couldn't type a lick when I was working with her. But but I think she was just fooling everybody. She must have known how to type. But anyway, she was his assistant from 1918 till the day he died. And even after he died, she took care of all the, quote, secret files, unquote. Oh, yeah, we're definitely going to get into that, too, during this conversation. Would it be fair to say that the things that you know about Hoover, the intimate insights that you have about Hoover, are not because of your direct relationship with him, but because of your direct and close relationship with Miss Gandy and other people, assistant directors, etc., that you had the opportunity to meet while you worked in that front office? I think it's a combination of things. I, I've had, I had quite a bit of contact with him, and usually on a daily basis. But everything was formal, Jerry. You know, there was nothing personal. There were a couple of times he had some personal stuff with me, but very rarely. That office was so run with so much formality, and the rules were always his. There was no question about it. What was interesting is to observe the people that were coming to have a meeting with them, very powerful people, senators, congressmen, businessmen, and he always made them wait in the reception room. I had a direct line to him from my office to his inner office, and I would announce that Jerry is here for her 10 o'clock appointment, and he would say, have her wait. And you'd wait about 10 minutes, and then he would call me and say, have Jerry come in. I don't, I don't remember one appointment, Jerry, that he didn't have them wait, no matter who they were. And that says a lot right there. Yeah, I guess. There are a number of things that I want to talk to you about. You already mentioned the quote-unquote secret files. Uh, you've already mentioned his treatment, or at least his reputation of how he treated 
people in Congress and other officials and leaders in Washington. And then the other thing I want to talk about is COINTELPRO. Why don't we start with that first? Because I think that leads into a lot of our other discussions. What was COINTELPRO? It was the counterintelligence program that started in 1956 and went to 1971. And basically what it was was a program to disrupt. It started off disrupting the Communist Party and related parties, socialistic and communistic areas. And it was a matter of infiltrating these various, if you want to call them subversive groups. And at the time the program was started, communism and anti-communism was a big deal. That was the McCarthy era. And, you know, it was horrible from a lot of standpoints. But the counterintelligence program was basically to disrupt organizations. And one of the first organizations that the Bureau disrupted was the Ku Klux Klan. They infiltrated them with this counterintelligence program. And it was like maybe four out of five Klansmen were FBI informants because they didn't know who was snitching on who. And that was part of the program is to cause that type of disruption in this organization. So it was against the Communist Party, Communist USA, and the Ku Klux Klan. But then it continued into the 60s and 70s where there was a new subversive threat. And when I was there, it was during the Vietnam War, which was probably the most turbulent time in U.S. history other than the Civil War, at least in my opinion. That counterintelligence program then was switched to what was referred to as the new left, the radical extreme left. And I don't know why it was printed that way, but it was always new left, capital N and capital L. And those were groups domestic terrorist groups, the Weathermen, which was the violent faction of the Students for Democratic Society. They teamed up with the Black Liberation Group and the Black Panthers. And their purpose was to declare war against the United States, defeat the United States, defeat imperialism, and defeat capitalism and create a a classless world. I know that sounds far-fetched, but that was what was going on with them. They bombed police stations. They bombed government buildings. I was involved with some of those investigations of the weathermen and then the underground weathermen. You know, you say in your book that the America that J. Edgar Hoover was watching at that time was an America beset by sexual promiscuity, drug use, crime, all done by hippies and draft dodgers and white revolutionaries and black revolutionaries. And I love the fact that you wrote, and angry, brawless women. <laughs> <laughs> they were, indeed. <laughs> I even teased Helen Gandy about that, but very carefully. But this COINTEL program that you talked about that was used so successfully against the Klan, America did not feel as happy about the same program when they learned about it, because, of course, it was a secret program, when they learned that it was being used against these other Americans. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I think what you brought up is really an interesting note, that no one ever complained about the counterintelligence program that violated the civil rights of the Klansmen. But when it became known that the Bureau was using the same tactics against these other groups, the Bureau was criticized like crazy by the press, you know, the newspapers. Fortunately, we didn't have cable TV at the time where we really get blasted. But this basically, Jerry, was psychological warfare to yeah, undermine. Could, could you, yeah, explain that more. What what could, kind of could, things were they doing to To disrupt? undermine the, these movements planning false media stories, distributing bogus literature, publications, sending anonymous letters to create dissent with, within and between the groups to break down their internal organizations. It was pretty difficult when, when I was out there, too, because you didn't know who, were, who the members were, so you'd have to go over the, out after the entire organization. And it was a very difficult thing. My involvement was, wasn't that big. I was infiltrating college students at the time in 
Southern Ohio. I, I was pretty young, and I looked younger than I was. And so I was into three colleges. I roamed from college to college as a third-year political science major. Basically, I was just trying to disrupt the Students for Democratic Society, send these messages to them, send messages to their parents to tell them how naughty their children were. Just a lot of a lot of civil rights violations, to be honest with you. But we thought it was in the best interest of national security, so we drank the Kool-Aid. I'm not quite sure how I feel about it today. Well, I know you wrote in your book that at one point you just decided, and usually agents don't get to decide what they want to do, but you decided that you didn't want to be a part of the this harassment program anymore. Well, it was it was a double-edged, not a double-edged sword, it was a two-pronged tool because I objected to us arresting and going after AWOLs absent without leave in the military. And that was a big statistic. And I don't know how they push statistics when you were an agent, but statistics were a big deal. Oh, they were a big deal, too. Remember and the uh, FD-515? I'll tell you, the statistics were just absolutely crazy. And you weren't there when you had conscription in the army. So these people were all drafted into the army, these young kids, 18, 19, 20 years old. They were homesick. They'd come home. Paperwork would come across our desk to go out and arrest this quote, unquote, fugitive. And it really bothered me what we were doing in that respect, the same way of harassing these particular groups. I got away with it because I objected to it. And one of the things I objected to more than anything, Jerry, was the whole draft process, the the selective service draft board, how they discriminated against these young people. And the ones that I was apprehending were in northern Kentucky and southern Ohio. And when I'm saying they were discriminated against, a whole bunch of us were able to avoid the draft by going to college full time. I was going to law school full time. So I had an, I guess it's an S2 classification, a student deferment. And then in the bureau, I had a job deferment. So people are complaining about other people who were draft dodgers. Looked at myself. I guess I was too, but I was playing the system. But these kids weren't in, able to play the system. They weren't able to. So they were really discriminated against. They just, it was a terrible thing. When I saw how sad it was, you know, you go in a house and there's, you're taking the son away from a mother who's crying and pleading with you. And I'm going, this is a bunch of crapola. I just had to adjust my moral compass at the time. And so I told my SAC, special agent in charge of the Cincinnati office, that I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to be involved with the COINTEL program. And I absolutely don't want to be involved in apprehending these young kids just for statistical purposes. You know, we're, okay. we're now talking about when you were, when you became an agent. When I was out, yeah, when I was yeah. out in the field. So, so let's, uh, let, let's go back. So when you first become an FBI employee was back in August of 1965. Right, correct. And... How did you end up as an FBI employee? My senior year in college, I went to State University of New York outside of Buffalo, New York. And my my major was in education. And I did my student teaching, 15 weeks of student teaching. And I said, this is not for me. I can't be a teacher. But I, <laughs> I wanted to do something because I was an athlete. I played five sports in high school, varsity sports in high school and college. And so I wanted to find something where I could do something physically and still have to think every once in a while. And we had a state police barracks in the college town, Fredonia, New York. And I went to the police barracks to see if they had some programs in the state police that would pay for graduate school because I, you know, I wanted to continue my education. And the captain said they didn't have such a thing, but asked if I'd fill out an application. They'd love to have me apply for a trooper's position. And so I told him I'd think about it. 
And I left the office kind of disappointed because I was hoping they had such a program. And outside the building was this sneaky FBI agent who was a resident agent in Jamestown, New York, about 30 miles away. And he said, I couldn't help but overhear your conversation with the captain. He said, how would you like to work for the FBI? And I said, I really don't know much about the FBI. I, I, I do know that Jay Gruber is their director. But honestly, I don't think I'm qualified to be a special agent. And he said, you're not. And I said, why the hell are you asking me then? I was 21 years old at the time. And as you know, back then, the earliest age is 23 to become an agent. So anyway, he talked me. I asked him to show me his credentials again, because all of a sudden I'm thinking this guy's full of baloney. You know, he just didn't seem right. And so he was a little upset when I asked him to see the credentials again, but he did. And he said, well, I'll send you some information and blah, blah, blah. I guess an application followed. Yeah, I remember when I came into the Bureau, I mean, for many years, we spent a lot of time trying to find young people to send down to FBI headquarters to work as clerical employees, (laughs) busloads. And so I went through that whole process. They sent me to Quantico for three weeks to learn about the Bureau so that I could give congressional tours. And I did, I did that quite a bit. And that was a lot of fun. And, and so you ended, I, up, you ended up working in what department? Crime records. But we were cutting out newspaper articles, you know, that sort of thing, to send them to Hoover's office. Anything that said the FBI. We, we had to look. And so we went through all kinds of newspapers, clipping things and answering letters from kids that I grow up to be an FBI agent. You know, there was a lot of mystique back then. There was, there was still the leftovers from the gangster era where people still felt that FBI agents walked on water. And it was kind of nice. And so I did that for just about a year, and a position opened up in Hoover's office, and a couple of assistant directors, I guess, recommended me to that position. Well, you you got to hold up there for a minute, because there are thousands of people working in administrative support positions at FBI headquarters. So why Paul Letursky? I mean, it's a a huge job. You know, it may not have been great paying and and high on the clerical pay scale, but working in Hoover's office directly with him was something that a very special, selected young man would be asked to do. So what was it that made you that person? I, I think within the crime records division, I had a lot of exposure You know, I got to know the assistant directors. And when people went to their congressmen or senators to have a tour arranged for the FBI uh, headquarters, and incidentally, at the time, the FBI tour was the second most popular tour in Washington, second to the White House tours. And so when we got requests from a congressman's office, I was one of the people that they would have take on tour. So I had a lot of exposure, and I had exposure to section chiefs and assistant directors. I have no idea who recommended me, but the section chief said to me, I think you better take the job. And I'm going, really? No kidding. You know, what you, You're what not going to say no. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely right. Were you afraid? Because here you are. You want to become a special agent one day. And I have heard the stories about Hoover deciding he didn't like someone and absolutely disrupting their career or getting rid of the person. So for somebody aspiring to become a special agent, I mean, you were taking a risk that you weren't going to mess up. But you want to know something, Jerry? I was too young to know better. (laughs) I was 23 years old when I went to work for him. To me, it was a job, and I was going to law school at night, and so my my days were quite full, and I'd go into the office, and I just did what I have to do, and to be honest with you, knowing what I know now, and if I was offered that job today, I wouldn't take it. I'd be scared to death, but I wasn't frightened then because I didn't know better. Well, I have heard stories, and you can tell me whether they're true or not, and I'm sure you have some of your own that I'm going to try to get you to tell us, but 
I've heard stories where Hoover might have been on an elevator with somebody, an agent, that he didn't like the color of his shirt or the fact that he had acne. And the next thing you know, that agent wasn't an agent anymore, or at least he wasn't an agent working in you know the Washington, D.C. or headquarters area. Well, right? I think those, those stories are exaggerated, and I'll tell you why. I had to tell every assistant, I had a direct line to every assistant director, and I had to tell them when Hoover was coming to the office, you know, I'd just be pressing buttons. He's in the building. He's in his office. And he's going to lunch. He's back in a building. And what these uh, assistant directors did or had their section chiefs do, uh, we were in the Justice Department and our offices were on the fifth floor. And so what the different divisions did is they would assign young clerical people like myself to each floor by the elevator bank to make sure nobody got on the elevator when Hoover and Clyde Tolson were leaving or coming. And so Jimmy Crawford, who was Hoover's chauffeur, would call me as soon as he got in the building and say they're on their way. And then I'm going pressing buttons. They're in the building. They're in the building. They're in the building. And so he scrambled to make sure nobody was on those elevators. So for somebody with pimples on an elevator to get fired as an agent. I find that hard to believe. But what does it say that everybody was too scared <laughs> to even <laughs> get on the elevator, that they had to do a warning system so no one would try well, to the, get on the elevator with him? I, I guess the thing is, people in the uh, upper echelon, they know if something went wrong because of someone that worked in their department they'd be suffering more than that young person. Hey, if I failed in Hoover's office, whoever recommended me for that position, they'd be in Butte, Montana in a, in a quick period of time. And people other than Hoover made a lot of decisions thinking that this is what Hoover wanted. Let me give you an example. I'm, I'm sure you heard about the blue ink, that Hoover is the only one that could use blue ink. on Yes. Memo. I don't know if you've, you've probably heard that, right? Yeah, I've heard it. Uh, of course, it was way before my time because I didn't come into the FBI until 10 years after his death. Yeah, right. I, I understand that. But but this was a real thing. He was the only one that could use blue ink on written communications, except for Helen Gandy, because she signed his signature on everything. If he signed stuff, it would look like a forgery. His handwriting wasn't as good as hers. So all these letters and everything you just see signed J. D. Hoover. Helen Gandy actually signed them. The supervisors or executives in the bureau I responded to the blue ink. I was involved in a uh, hijacking of a TWA airplane at Dallas Airport. It was the first hijacking for extortion. And we were involved in a shootout. Somehow the Washington Post were able to have their journalists get on a tarmac and they were taking photographs and and stuff appeared in the Washington Post the next day. And John Mullen, who was one of the agents out there with us, he had somewhat of a start of a beer belly, if you will, for a better description. And his picture was on the front page of the Washington Post. And Hoover took the blue pen and he put a circle around John's belly. And he wrote, is this man an agent? H. The SAC didn't know how to respond. He didn't want to tell them, yes, he was an agent, because it would be that SAC's fault for the guy not adhering to the weight requirements or what have you. So within a week, John Mullen was transferred to the Indianapolis office, and that was the end of that. Wow. So, so, so who those been, stories... Who, Hoover true. didn't say transfer him or Hoover didn't say discipline. And all he said, is this man an agent? And look what happened. Poor John, off to Indianapolis from Alexandria. So, And basically only because the SAC was afraid for his job. Exactly. I can't tell you how many times those type of things occurred where the supervisors or the assistant directors they weren't sure what Hoover wanted to hear or how he wanted to hear it. A lot of times they were just perplexed. But can you imagine these grown men, executives, having this type of fear and concern? But I, I guess they were worried, you know, they get to a certain point in their career 
they don't want to go back out in the field busting the bricks or whatever. And so they just do what they feel they have to do. And consequently, Hoover got a lot of misinformation, and he had to make decisions on things. But by the time it went from a field agent to the supervisor to the ASAC to the SEC to someone, section chiefs or whatever in in uh, Washington, it's like the kid's game of telephone. By the time the final call was made to Hoover, he wasn't getting all the information he should be getting from an accurate standpoint. Because uh-huh. of the fear of what he may do if he heard the truth? Yeah. Wow. And, and, but I'll tell you, uh, Jerry, I didn't see that in him. I, I saw a different person in a lot of these stories you hear. Please, give us an example of... Well, you know, how often did you have to go to in-service at Quantico? Back in your day, did you have to do that? Because I know when I was there, everybody went to Quantico for like a, a week's in-service. Yeah, I went to Quantico for in-service, but no, not that frequently. I would get calls from agents at Quantico from field offices. They were in service. They would call my office and ask if he could see Mr. Hoover, just wanting to meet him. And I would ask them, you know, is there anything that you wish to discuss with them or any issues or anything? And most often was, no, we just want to meet him. I've never met him. And since I'm here at Quantico and I'm going to be in D.C., I'd love to be able to shake hands with him. And I'll tell you, Jerry, he never refused one of those appointment requests while I was there. Not one. Wow. And there were some agents that came in that had family problems. They had a child that had uh, respiratory problems, and they were in a city. They wanted to go to a drier climate because of their children. And I'll tell you, I remember one agent, I don't recall his name, but he was one of those that came in and asked Hoover if he could be transferred to a drier climate because of respiratory problems his child had. And I got a note on my desk Before this agent left the Justice Department building, I had a note already on my desk that said, have agent such and such transferred to Phoenix, H, just like that. And they were transferred to Phoenix. So a lot of these stories that you hear about Hoover, he did have a heart. Yeah, that is surprising to me because it's the stories of just the opposite that you hear all the time where somebody did something wrong or something to embarrass the Bureau. And the note would say, you know, transfer this guy to Butte, not to Phoenix. <laughs> no, not to Phoenix. But uh, my point is, the guy wasn't a monster with his agents. He, he never refused a request for an appointment. And he generally satisfied the request from an agent that came and saw him. Now, the supervisors at Quantico or in the Bureau, whatever division it was, they tried to discourage these agents from calling up and getting an appointment because they were afraid that they'd say something or their hands would be sweaty or whatever these rumors were. If that agent screwed up in Hoover's office, it would be a reflection on that supervisor. And so they really tried to keep them from calling me and making an appointment. This is really interesting. So what percentage of the stories about Hoover's gruff and mean and vindictive personality, would you say are valid? Um, some, some were, some were, and, and he did have a vindictive side of him. And if he was truly upset, he would, you know, make sure someone was punished. I'll give you an example how he can be uh, vindictive. I mentioned this hijacking of the TWA aircraft. And this was before they had passenger screening. And Barkley was the hijacker. He had a, a 22 pistol, a straight razor, a can of gasoline. He flew out of Phoenix, Phoenix to uh, Dulles Airport in Washington. I forget how many people were on the airplane, like 138 or something. He had a real problem with the IRS over a $400 refund that he never got. I mean, he visited Washington, tried to get into the IRS to get his money, filed some kind of uh, claim with the Supreme Court who never answered him, obviously. Well, anyway, he said he wanted $100 million. And the reason he wanted all that money is he wanted to destroy it as a symbol of his being oppressed. 
This mm-hmm. is the podcast episode that I did with Jim Ciano and Tom oh. Baker. Jim drove while I was in the back seat with this hijacker. For people who want to hear the, the full story, was episode 163. And Jim Ciano and Tom Baker, they talk about this airplane hijacking that you're mentioning here. So what were you saying about the vindictiveness of Hoover as it relates to this? This is where I was getting at. I guess TWA came up with about $100,000, and we filled bags and what have you and shredded paper, and put it on the airplane. It took off, and, you know, we all wiped our heads saying, thank God he's somebody else's problem, you know, some other field office. He got about as far as Cleveland. And he said, President Nixon apparently doesn't know how to count. I asked for a hundred million. I'm coming back for the rest. There's only a hundred thousand here. And in unison, you could hear our guys go, oh, when we knew that Barkley was a real nut job, we knew we couldn't let that airplane get off the ground again because everybody would be killed. And I was next to uh, Jack McDermott, who was our SAC at the time. And he's talking to Charles Killing class who was the CEO of TWA. And Tillinghast kept saying to McDermott, don't you damage that airplane. You know how much it's worth. And I'm standing right next to McDermott while he's on the phone. And it got to the point where McDermott said to him, Mr. Tillinghast, I have to be concerned about the people on that airplane. As far as I'm concerned, you can shove your airplane up your ass. That is a quote. And then McDermott turned to me and he said, Get me Mr. Hoover's office. I think I better give him a heads up. Well, a couple of months later, there were these uh, hijackings of four wide-body airplanes going to Kennedy that the Palestinian Liberation Front hijacked the airplanes. Make a long story short, Nixon said we have to do something about that. Before that, you know, they they weren't paying too much attention to hijackings. So Nixon wanted to have sky marshals on the airplanes. So I was one of the first 25 sky, they didn't call us sky marshals. I don't know what they called us, but we were armed people on the airplane trying to determine what we can do to prevent or deter hijackings. So I was sent to JFK Airport, Kennedy Airport in uh, New York to meet with the FAA and the senior pilots uh, of both TWA and Pan American. And with this argument that McDermott had, and Hoover got on the phone with him, Hoover said to Jack McDermott, I know Paul Letursky. I know he can handle his assignment. You tell him to tell the FAA, I'm not allowing any of my agents to fly on TWA. They can only go on the Pan Am flights. Back then, there were only two carriers, international carriers that were flag carriers for the United States. And Hoover said, you remember what Tillinghast did with that hijacking a few months ago? I'm not doing crap for that guy. My agents are not going to get on the airplane and do anything. So that's where I was going with how he didn't forget things. And he had a way of coming back with that sort of thing. Yeah, um, so that means then, and I'm not here to, to vilify or defend Hoover. I'm, I'm just here to enjoy your stories as you recount your your uh, time with him but it does sound like the SACs and other high bureau officials at headquarters did have some reason behind being afraid to tell Hoover things I yeah mean, they're, I think they're, so yeah no, I think you're absolutely right right so there, there may be times that they took action that was blamed on him but was really in their anticipation of what they thought he would do. But that was also based on things that they knew he had done. Right. And that's what I was going to say. I didn't have personal knowledge of some of those things, but there's no question in my mind that the assistant directors and SACs and what have you, they heard stories of disciplinary action. A lot of it wasn't Hoover. People thought it was Hoover that made the decision, but Clyde Tolson had a lot to do with those decisions, probably more so than Hoover. You talk about him in the book. Explain to everyone who Clyde Tolson was and what you thought of him. He was the associate director. He was the number two man, and he and Hoover were inseparable. 
Wherever Hoover went, you knew that Tolson was going to be a few steps behind and to the left. I really didn't know Tolson. He wasn't the type of person you could get to know. I don't even know what his voice sounded like. Every once in a while, I would have to take something to Tolson's office, which was right next kitty corner to Hoover's. They had private entrance to each other's offices, so he didn't even have to go out in the hallway to get into Hoover's office. And while I was there, Jerry, and at the time I wasn't aware of it, but I later became aware of it, he was suffering a lot of many strokes and he was having real physical and mental problems. But Hoover covered all that up to keep him on board because they were so close, so close to the point where a lot of people thought there was a homosexual situation between the two. But I don't, I don't know if there was or not. All I know is there were times I'd have to take something to Tolson's office. Dottie Skillman was his Helen Gandy. And I'd say, hello, Dottie. And Tolson would be coming to her desk to pick something up. And I'd go, good morning, Mr. Tolson. He would just turn and look at me, turn away, and walk into his private office. Never said crap. I'm telling you, I never heard his voice. What so, did Helen Gandy think of Tolson? She hated him. Okay, that says everything, doesn't it? Matter of fact, she wanted me to escort her to Hoover's funeral. And she said to me, I don't want to sit next to that guy. You sit between me and him. And, you know, I, I, I cause, are you familiar with the name J.P. Moore? Well, he was the number three man in the Bureau. It was Hoover Tolson, J.P. Moore, John P. Moore. And he was like my mentor. And I don't know why he took a liking to me. Maybe because we had similar backgrounds. Both of us went to night school, to law school. And I, he just kind of, he would tell me things that I was always surprised that he would reveal stuff of things that were going on in the Bureau. But J.P. Moore and Helen Gandy were very close, almost like conspiracy theories between them. Well, anyway, J.P. Moore called me in the Alexandria field office and said, uh, Miss Gandy wants you to go with her to the funeral. Moten, who was the chauffeur, says, Moten will pick you up at 9 o'clock in the morning. What am I going to tell him? I don't want to go. So so I had a chance. We picked up Miss Gandy first. She and I had a chance to really talk together. And this is the first time I saw her since Hoover's death. And I did ask her. I said, uh, Miss Gandy, why are you asking me? To come to this funeral, I says, you know, I appreciate wanting to be with you. She says, because you're the son I never had or the grandson I never had, and I think I need you with me. And then when she, when we were pulling up to get Tolson out of Tolson's apartment, and he came out limping, and I don't, I don't even remember, you know, he was just limping, and the chauffeur was helping him. And she looked at me and she says, look at him, hasn't done a thing in years. I mean, she really decided, she says, and I want to make sure you better sit between he and I, because I don't want to have anything to do with him. So I, I think the reason goes way back for the same reason he ignored me. He was probably the only one that could go into Hoover's office without her knowing about it because they had connecting office doors. And so he would just go through their private doors and tick her off. So anyway, she wasn't too crazy about him. While I was there, he had all these mini strokes and he really wasn't functioning. Guys like J.P. Moore and Mark Felt, they covered everything that he did. Anybody else, they would have retired, gone on some kind of disabled list. Hoover was loyal to him then. Yeah. Kept him on. I don't know what it is now, Jerry, but back then there was a mandatory retirement act that you had to retire from the federal government position once you turned 70 years old. And Hoover turned 70 the year that I came to the Bureau. But President Johnson kept him on. He signed an executive order exempting him from that retirement act. He was known to have said about keeping Hoover on because a lot of people thought, He should be forced into retirement. And it was an easy way of making him retire by implementing that retirement act, that piece of legislation. But Johnson said, he said, I'd rather have him in my tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. 
And that was a quote from President Johnson. But that's the way he spoke. And so Hoover was exempt from that law. And then with Tolson being 70 and Helen Gandy being 70, there was a sort of small print that said, if they're considered essential, they can we can extend their age in retirement. So Gandhi was in her 70s. Tolson was in her 70s. But Gandhi was still sharp. She has such a sharp mind. I don't know what to tell you about Tolson. Nobody knew that much about him. And people kind of covered for him, at least when I was there. As a matter of fact, at the funeral, J.P. Moore told us to go much earlier because he didn't want anybody to see Tolson in a wheelchair being pushed into the church. There are two things that people think about when they think about Hoover, and both are not that great. But I wanted to say that early on, you write in your book that during the 1950s, the Bureau enjoyed generally good relations with all the civil rights movement and African Americans in the South, and that the director was widely admired in the black community. For example, there was an article that you talk about that was in the popular black-oriented Ebony magazine, and in that magazine, they called Hoover the nation's foremost law enforcement officer and praised his deep sense of values in dealing with his fellow man. But we all know that that didn't last long. In the respect of his later relationship with Martin Luther King and the different recordings and wiretaps that were conducted at the time. First of all, I wrote this book without taking, I I have no reason to defend who, and I think I say things in that book that support that fact. I have no reason to defend him. I have no reason to grant sainthood on him. I was just writing what I feel uh, and what I saw and what I heard. And with the Martin Luther King situation, Hoover called Martin Luther King the most notorious liar in the United States. And that's when the relationship between the two of them just unraveled completely. And the reason he said that is because Martin Luther King was complaining in the press that Hoover only sent Southern agents to the Southern states. And this was some investigation in Georgia, I believe, that Martin Luther King was criticizing. And he blamed Hoover or he said that Hoover would only send agents who grew up in the South to the Southern offices, which was completely untrue. And so that probably started. Now, as far as the phone taps and the bugging, the purpose of that and, and the wiretaps. By the way, Bobby Kennedy, when he was the attorney general, authorized those wiretaps. And the reason they were authorized is because King had two people that were his senior advisors that were actually in the Communist Party. One of them was by the name of uh, Stan Levinson. And the other one, I think his name was Jack Odell or something like that. I'd have to look it up. But they were senior advisors and senior speechwriters. And Bobby Kennedy, and Hoover, and a few of the other top people felt that Levinson was writing speeches to try, uh, when he made the speeches, to try and attract all the followers of King to situations where they could be exposed to communism. And so it was a communistic type of thing. It wasn't a racial matter at all. And when you have someone like Bobby Kennedy, and I saw his signature on the wiretap, by the way, Bobby Kennedy approved those wiretaps and wanted those wiretaps because there was still this communist threat. And they had two guys who were the senior advisors to King. Now, just like you, I'm not here certainly to defend Hoover, but you do make a point in your book that every president he served knew what Hoover and the Bureau were doing in terms of domestic security and surveillance. Did I say that? Page 151. You had a different book than mine. I probably did say that because <laughs> because if I I made a mistake if I said that because the counterintelligence program went through four presidential administrations without the president or attorney general knowing that we were doing that. Oh, that's interesting. That's yeah. really interesting. Because I actually, as I'm reading the book and reading that particular line, 
started to think that, which again is not an excuse, if he was doing these things and that presidents and the attorney generals all approved it and all signed off on it, then, you know, we can't vilify him without vilifying Johnson or Kennedy or Eisenhower. Right. And I'm glad you brought up an Eisenhower thing because Hoover's also been called a hypocrite because he refused to hire gay men as FBI agents. And very few people know that Eisenhower sent out an executive order telling all the agencies in the federal government not to hire gay people because they were a threat to the, like the Soviet Union to blackmail them. And so the fact that Hoover didn't hire gay special agents, he was following directives of Eisenhower. And actually 5,000 employees in the federal government lost their jobs because they were identified as homosexuals. But they criticized Hoover for it. Nobody ever read about an executive order from Eisenhower. I'm not sure if Hoover objected. Not I understand that a director can't object to an executive order, but I'm not sure if he would have objected to the executive order and that he didn't, you know, agree well, with that with the action. Yeah, well, you know what, I agree with you. I'm not so sure either. Because he had his own mind. And if he thought that one of his agents, I mean, think of the times. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was there, it was in the 60s and 70s. So think of the times even before that. I agree with you, Jerry. I, I would think he probably wouldn't have them either because they would be subjected to extortion. You know, he's, he's a complicated man. Very you complex. Know. Very yeah. complex. I think probably one of the most interesting things that I did read that you, uh, all of it was interesting, but one of the most was when you said that Hoover was keeping the number of electronic surveillances strictly limited and that, believe it or not, he didn't like taps and bugs and he considered wiretapping to be a lazy man's investigative tool. And that's true. And a lot of the wiretaps that occurred under his administration were unbeknownst to him. The people out in the field were doing, even though Hoover told the field people, you need his approval before you do things. He did not care for bugging or wiretapping. Tell all. us about that three-ring binder. It was just a black three-ring binder, and it had uh, the telephone taps and the buggings that were going on at the time. And there weren't very many pages in it, Jerry. It was no big deal. The binder was hidden in plain sight in the conference room with, among other books. And I would have to take it off the shelf, put it on his desk in the morning. Most of the stuff was very cryptic. You know, as I said earlier, I was doing a job. I was going to law school. I could have cared less what was in that binder about wiretaps and everything else. And there wasn't that much there. But he wanted it next to him during the day in case he got a call from the attorney general or the president about something and he could refer to that book. That is fascinating because somebody whose reputation is about these secret tapes and secret files to learn that he really did not approve of these methods is, is mind-blowing. There's a whole bunch of things that are mind-blowing. Like a lot of people thought he wanted to expand the FBI and have a national federal police force. That was the last thing he wanted. That's why he founded the uh, National Academy, because he felt that fighting crime was a local thing, not a federal thing. And he wanted nothing to do with having a federal police department. And he fought that with presidents that wanted to expand the FBI's jurisdiction and Hoover just wouldn't accept it. And he wasn't afraid to object to things with the presidents or attorneys general. I think probably very few people knew that he fought FDR during World War II about the uh, internment of Japanese Americans. Hoover totally objected to it. And he just thought that was the biggest civil rights violation that you could possibly think of. But he lost that battle with FDR. 
but people really don't know that he he fought him over that. You know, a lot of people also suggest that he was a racist. I've had this discussion with with other agents as to why we didn't have uh, that many African American agents, and it almost was a consensus. And maybe it was just casual thinking because if you and I were just out having a beer as a couple of agents talking about the Bureau. A lot of the guys that I talked with about this, they said, if an African-American had a law degree and met all these other standards that Hoover required, why would he take a job as a special agent? He'd get a much better job, a much higher paying job in the private sector, in a corporate world. Why would he become an agent? But once he opened up the application process, then he did have people like Aubrey Lewis and Wayne Davis, you know, who I knew personally. I I think you knew Wayne too. Yeah. He did have those people who wanted to be agents. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if that is necessarily correct. When you joined the FBI as a clerical employee back in 1965, the mm-hmm. reputation for the Bureau was still at a very high point. And so this was definitely a you know, feather in your cap to become a clerical employee. And you know, I could see why your ultimate goal was to become a special agent. How did Helen Gandy and Director Hoover feel about your aspirations? And did you think that they helped you? And well, they were very supportive, very supportive. And every once in a while, I'd get a lecture from him about coming back to the seat of government after I'm out there and everything. He says, but you've got to watch what you're doing out there. You've got to be very positive in what you're doing. Collect as many chits and favors as you can, but use them wisely. You know, he would be giving me that type of advice. And Helen Gandy followed me all over the place, you know, with we talk on the phone, we'd send little notes back and forth. And I have to admit, the reason I went to Alexandria, Virginia, instead of New York City as my second office was because of Helen Gandy. She never admitted it, but we both knew when we talked to each other. She wanted me close to her. And so Alexandria, as you know, is right across the Potomac River from Washington. And when I got to Alexandria, I periodically stop in and see her on Saturdays, knowing she was the only one there on Saturdays. And when I when I worked with her every Saturday, I sat at her desk. She hadn't got Hoover's approval to have me sit on her desk and handle his mail. And he was very guarded of the confidentiality stuff that came across Gandhi's desk. And I would bring in a brown bag with a couple of sandwiches every Saturday because Gandhi would come in about two o'clock. She'd go to the salon, the hairdresser, and then come in at two o'clock and she and I would share a tuna fish sandwich or whatever. And I would always compliment her on her hair, telling how beautiful her hair looked. It looked the same every Saturday. But each Saturday you still made her I, smile with that. Yeah, uh, I still complimented her about her hair and she liked that. We became very close. She worked for Hoover for many, many years, and I'm sure there were many, many young men who worked in his front office, but she took a liking to you. I mean, she had you be her escort to Hoover's funeral. Yeah, and it was by what, invitation only. Actually. And what was that connection? How, how? What was it that made you and Helen Gandy connect during those a, two years that you worked there? I had a lot of dirt on her, and I was threatening to close her. <laughs> no, it's not true. <laughs> All right. Well, now that you bring that up, there's just a few more things that I wanted to talk to you about. And one of the things was the rumor that Hoover had dirt on everyone and that Helen Gandy was the keeper of these secret files. Yeah, well, all of that's exaggerated. I'm not saying they weren't there. And there were more than thousands of files on people from congressmen and senators to movie stars to what have you. But what they didn't know is the reason there were files opened up was incidental to something else. And their name happened to be mentioned in an investigation or, or something else that was going on. And if your name was mentioned, 
you went into the files. So you're uh, saying these weren't extensive files on this individuals' personal no, lives. And, and when you think about it, he was the head of the FBI and, well, the Bureau of Investigation and then the FBI for 48 years. And he never extorted anybody with these files. There was not one incident where he used anything in the files to extort someone or to you know, get some privilege of some sort. A lot of the presidents asked him to do things to find out information on, on people. There's a lot of things that Hoover had to do, even if he didn't want to, because a president would say they put the tag national security. And when they put that tag, we have to do this for national security. What, what's the director supposed to do when the president tells them we have a national security issue here? I want you to look this up and find out this and find out that. So the rumor that Hoover was able to stay in the office for so long because he had dirt on presidents and was blackmailing them, that wasn't true? No, wasn't true. So why was it then that Hoover, I mean, he was the director of the FBI for 48 years. How did he last so long working with so many different presidents and through the ups and downs, the highs and lows of the FBI's reputation during those, well, that, those periods? I, my best answer to that is I look at him as probably the best bureaucrat that ever lived, not the best FBI director, the best bureaucrat. He knew how to play political poker, and he did that well. I don't, I don't know if I put it in a book or not. I probably did. This is an example. On his desk, he had a paperweight that was a clear plastic paperweight, and embossed inside that plastic was a coin. And on one side of the coin was a donkey, and the other side was an elephant. And if, and if his first meeting in the morning was with a Democrat, I had to make sure that the donkey was showing on top of his paper. And then if a Republican came in, I'd have to go in the office and turn the paperweight over so an elephant would be showing. But that's how precise he was in everything he did. And I just think he was just an unbelievable bureaucrat. To be honest with you, Jerry, I did not see anything where he would use anything in the files to extort anybody. And nobody can name one thing, one piece of extortion that he used. He did have material on people, but he never used it. Very, and very that, interesting. That I know of. I had such a good relationship with Gandhi. She would have told me something. It sounds like the reason that Helen Gandhi enjoyed your company so much is because probably everybody else that got into that office that was in that space with Hoover was so afraid and so scared of saying anything to her or getting in trouble with her that they didn't feel comfortable enough to joke. But you were real. You know, you were yourself with her. And it sounds like that is what made her, I guess the word is adore you so much. You must be adorable. I oh. am. <laughs> 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 well, uh, let, let me uh, just back up one more thing about Helen Gandy and me. I didn't know that much about Helen Gandy and how powerful she was when I first came to Hoover's office. And I was there for about two months, and she insulted me with something. And uh, Jerry, it was probably so insignificant, I can't even remember what it was. But being a cocky, snot-nosed law student, I'm not going to have my dignity hurt by this old lady. So I went to her office after she said something to me that I took offense to. And I, I remember this. I said, Miss Gandy, I don't know you very well, but I want you to know me. And I was offended by how you talked at me. And I just want you to know I am not going to condone that type of relationship. I said, there's only two types of people I know in my short time in the Bureau. It's people who need the job and people who want the job. And I can tell you, I don't need this job. And I'm planning on being here for a long time. I turned around and walked away. Now, her administrative assistant, a girl by the name of Irma Metcalf, who's great, 
she came to my office after that because she heard she referred to it as my tirade with with Helen Gandy. She said, "Paul, I hope you didn't commit career suicide. Nobody's ever talked to Miss Gandy that way, except for maybe Hoover, but on just on certain times." And she says, I'm afraid you've just committed career suicide. That's when I realized how powerful she was. And so I waited a couple of days before I went and apologized to her. I said I was just so upset and impulsive. And I said, that's really not me. And I'm really sorry if I offended you. And after that, we never had one misagreement. I have to tell you, Paul, that, you know, reading your book, the director, my years assisting J. Edgar Hoover, was eye-opening. I learned so many things about Director Hoover that I didn't know. I learned a lot about what was going on with the FBI you know, during that very volatile time period that you were a clerical employee and in your early days as a special agent. And so I really want to thank you for taking the time to share your intimate details about the FBI that you encountered in your relationships with the director and Miss Gandy and the other high bureau officials, as we say, HBOs and FBI headquarters. You did reach your goal to move from that position and to become an agent. That occurred about three years after you came to Washington, D.C. to work. And so when did you first become an agent? I went through agents training. My class was uh, September 1968. And honestly, Jerry, I planned on going there for 20, 25 years. It's just that situations occurred at the time, and I was involved with the airline industry because at the time, both airports in Washington were owned by the federal government. And every crime committed on those airports was a crime on a government reservation. And I was assigned to the airports. And so I got so deeply involved. I was involved in rape cases, murder cases, petty theft, you know, stuff the Bureau wouldn't be involved in otherwise. I just absolutely loved it. But as time went on and the federal aviation requirements changed and the airlines needed something, I was recruited by the law division of United Airlines. And it was an offer I couldn't pass up. At the time that you made that decision to leave the FBI, it is one of the kind of low points of the FBI. And we've had our ups and downs throughout history. What year did you leave? 73. As you write in your book, the damage to the reputation and prestige of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI was profound and long lasting to the point that the FBI TV series in 1974 was canceled. Did the fact that you could see at that point in time that the FBI was at a low point in the minds and hearts of some Americans, did that have anything to do with the reason that you decided to leave and and took that offer, that really great offer to go with the airlines? No, that wasn't the reason. I left at the end of 1973. I had a good offer. And what had happened, this was a year after Hoover died. L. Patrick Gray came on, then Ruckel's house, and then Kelly. So in my last year there, there were three directors or acting directors of the FBI. I didn't know where the FBI was going. I had an offer. I had to make a choice. And I guess one of the things that really bothered me was L. Patrick Gray. As I mentioned to you, I was assigned to the airports, and so I I knew a lot of the FAA people. And I got a call from the director's office when Gray was the acting director. They asked me to make arrangements to have Gray not be screened, not at a checkpoint, to be able to have his armored car drive onto the tarmac drive up to the airplane that was going to New London, Connecticut from Washington, D.C. And he lived just outside of New London, Connecticut. And I had to make arrangements with the head of security for Allegheny Airlines, which doesn't exist anymore, and the FAA to get permission for him to do this. What I didn't know at the time, 
until his return, because on his return from New London, there was absolutely no request to have him do any of this stuff. And I said, he had to be dealing with papers, with documents that he destroyed in Connecticut, New London. And sure enough, John Dean, the White House counsel, took Watergate information out of E. Howard Hunt's safe, gave it to Gray, and told him to destroy it. Well, he he held on to those papers for a long time. But now I'm part of what happened with destroying Watergate papers and documents by allowing him to bypass everything and be the first one on the airplane. And that really bothered me a lot. And just not knowing where the bureau was going. Senator Weicker, Connecticut senator, who was a friend of his, and he felt that he had to disclose it to Senator Weicker because they were friends. Weicker couldn't help but take advantage of telling the press, his friends at the press, just so he could continue having good relations with the press. And that's how it became known. And that's why Gray had to resign. He was never confirmed by the Senate. So when I'm thinking about where in the world the Bureau's going, it had nothing to do with Hoover's reputation that later on was destroyed. It had to do with what's going on at the time, plus the offer I got from United Airlines. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, you did. And I guess there are probably some agents in the FBI that are seeing what's happening with the Bureau's reputation today, and I hope that they stay that they know that it's part of the ebb and flow. Yeah. Not necessarily the FBI and what the FBI stands for, but what is just happening in America and, you know, how America <laughs> is changing and dividing and, and, and happening. But the agents on the street, they don't I change. Could, I couldn't agree more. And if I had to do it all over again, I might reconsider as to how long I'd stay. But leaving the Bureau had nothing to do with how I feel about the Bureau. To this day, I loved every minute of it. I can't say enough for the Bureau. I still have some thoughts as, geez, maybe I should have stayed. They have such good pensions. We've come to the part of the episode where I like to talk to people about when and why they joined the FBI. And I know that we've already talked about that a bit, but if you could just kind of explain to us why it was that you wanted to join the FBI. I take it by the time you filled out that long application, there were other reasons. Well, I gave it more thought. I looked at the stuff and I studied about the FBI. I got really impressed in saying, you know, I can really do that job because I was looking for something that I could do physically. I didn't have to stay behind the desk. And, and I wanted to use whatever intellectual qualities I had as well as physical. It was after I got the application and everything, I started thinking about it. And I said, yeah, I think this is going to fit my requirements as to what kind of career I want. I asked my guests to give us the last word. So what would you like to say? I was very fortunate in everything I've done. I can't tell you how many times working with the FBI, especially as an agent, that I would ask myself, I can't believe they're paying me to do this. I loved it so much. And if I had it to do all over again, I would have probably stayed as long as you stayed. E- even though I had great experiences in the airline industry and worked all kinds of international cases when I was a vice president of Pan American, dealing with international terrorism, working with a Scotland Yard and, GS- and GSG9, they all respected the Bureau. And it gave me an opening to these other international police agencies by the mere fact that I was a former FBI agent. That just opened doors, and I still miss it. And that's the end of the interview. You'll find a couple of photos of Paul Letursky, including one of him with Director Hoover. There's also a photo of Hoover and Helen Gandy together, plus links to several articles about Hoover Helen Gandy, and those secret files. And of course, there's a link to where you can purchase Paul's book, The Director, My Years Assisting J. Edgar Hoover. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. 
If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.